If you've got your Bibles, will you please turn to uh, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 to 5 is the text which we will spend some time together in this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 to 5. And I am reading from the English Standard Version. This is the word of God, dear friends. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of servants that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself. But I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart, then each one will receive his commendation from God. Let me pray. Our sovereign and eternal God in heaven, we do want to thank you for this morning, this wonderful privilege that I have to stand before your people. Mighty God, I ask that I will be a mouthpiece of you and I'll preach only that which is written and only that which is in the word. And I pray, O oh God, that uh, for all of us who are prone to wonder and have got many weaknesses, I pray that uh, the audience will not wonder but be fixated upon this word and that the Holy Spirit of God would be able to guide us and lead us to truth and convict us in areas where we have erred and areas where we fall short. I do want to pray, O oh God, that um, this word would be um, enforced upon our hearts such that, O oh God, we may be changed from the inside out. And I pray that if there may be any amongst us this morning who may not know you, saving you, who may not know your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that today will be their day of salvation. In his name I pray with thanksgiving in my heart. Amen. Well, dear friends, um, the Church of Christ over the years, or over the ages, has always been plagued by false teachers and false preachers and imposters. And this is true in today's world where you have people who masquerade as real preachers of, the, of God's word, having red carpets rolled out to them as they enter various churches, quote-unquote apostles, who have people wipe their faces or, or carry their Bibles and so forth and so forth. Some demand God-like allegiance, and more have... More recently, we've heard, uh, for example, Emmanuel Makandiwa, who says he is more gifted than God, uttering blasphemies. But when we look at our text this morning, that is not the picture that the Apostle Paul paints from verses 1 to 5 of chapter 4. But before we even get there, let us track back to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 to 23, where um, our dear brother uh, Doug left us. In fact, he left us in verse 15 uh, last time out. But I just want to, uh, by way of introduction, sort of flowing into chapter 4, use uh, chapter 3, verse 16 to 23 as a springboard. In verse 16 to 17, Paul makes it clear that the church as a whole, more specifically, uh, even this local church is God's temple. 
If anyone destroys God's temple by causing unnecessary division and strife, God will destroy them. This is because God's temple is holy. Those who are focused on causing divisions will be thwarted or destroyed by God. Look at verse 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that this God's spirit dwells in you? So he's speaking to the church as a whole. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy. And you as a church are the temple. In verse, uh, verses 18 to 20, uh, the Apostle Paul brings forth his arguments regarding the nature of church ministry. Uh, back to the contrast between worldly wisdom and true wisdom. Let us read there from verse 18 to 20. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. Verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. The Apostle Paul's point here is that worldly wisdom and godly wisdom are at odds with one another. They are, they're completely different. What man in this world emphasizes as wisdom to God is not. And if a believer is to be truly wise, he must be willing to be a fool according to the world. In fact, we as Christians stand opposed to the world system. Uh, we have been called out from the world and called into the church of God, into the temple of God. So we are at odds with the world. And so if we are to be found to be wise in accordance to God's standards, we are to be fools in the world. And he cites some OT passages there. Job 5.13 and Psalm 94 verse 11. And the wisdom of the world, dear friends, is vain. It puffs up and doesn't glorify God. And God knows this and observes this. Paul says this in verse 20. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Verse 21. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or, 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 or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God. The point that Paul uh, makes from verse 21 to 23 as he rounds up that passage, that little section there, is that he's emphasizing that if anyone is to boast in wisdom, he must boast in God, not in himself. Uh, remember, the whole section is about uh, these Corinthians who were uh, sort of causing partisanship and, and uplifting or sort of idolizing Apollos and for Apollos and for Paul, etc., etc. The Apostle Paul is saying, Let, if you are to boast, boast in God, not in man. All things belong to God, so even a poor and Apollos belong to God. So we must conduct ourselves appropriately in the temple of God. The, the, the title of my sermon this morning is True Preachers Are Servants of God. True Preachers Are Servants of God. And I want us to see, first of all, their characteristics. Uh, and secondly, I want us to see how, uh, well, their critical examination. So first, first of all is the characteristics and then their critical examination. And within the characteristics, I will break down and point to some points that we should meditate upon this morning. Verse 1 and 2. This is how one should regard us. 
as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. What is Paul referring to when he says this is how one should regard us? Well, he's referring to the previous chapter where the Corinthians were causing division, as I said earlier on, in the church by becoming partisan and elevating preachers to a level that is unhealthy. And these things had catastrophic consequences, even today in today's church. The moment we start elevating a preacher to an, unle uh, 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 well, an unhealthy level, it's got dire consequences. Idolatry, strife, division, favoritism. But he emphatically says, this is how you should regard us. How should the Corinthians regard Paul and the rest of the servants of Christ? You should regard us as servants in verse 1, of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Dear friends, we as preachers, number one, are servants and not idols. We are servants of Christ. We report to Christ Jesus and speak on behalf of Christ Jesus. The apostles were servants and the word used here in the Greek means someone who is an under rower, one who used to row in the lower bank, uh, the lower bank of the oars in the large ship. This signifies service in general of a lowly kind. So uh, true preachers of the word of God are really servants of Christ. In fact, if you cannot as a preacher, help arrange chairs in the morning, then I'm afraid you're not fit for pastoral ministry. If you cannot do the mundane tasks in the church, even sweep, if need be, you're not fit for pastoral ministry. The minister, the minister is a servant of Christ. He is required to work long, hard hours with little or no regard of his work and little appreciation. And the apostles were beaten for the gospel, dear friends. They suffered, they worked hard with their hands in emulation of the Lord Jesus Christ, their master. And this is a, a vast difference. It's a, it's a stark contrast to what we see today where we've got so-called pastors who are demanding ridiculous amount, uh, large sums of money and, uh, and private jets and uh, royal treatment, as it were. Servants of the Most High God are to behave in a different manner. And of course, dear friends, even as we think and meditate upon how preachers, servants are not idols, this can be abused in and of itself. This can, just like the Corinthians abused Apollos and Paul, so we can also abuse ministers, servants of God. We can take for uh, granted the fact that they are servants and begin to abuse them. For example, some are ill-treated by their own congregation. And I hope that this is not true of this congregation. Some, their children are ill-treated unfairly. They, they don't get paid enough or not get paid at all. And I'll touch on this later. They are, they are expected to spend many hours ministering and yet they don't get little comfort or even cushion. But what does the Bible require of congregants in their regards to their elders? Paul says this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards 
of the mysteries of God. What does this mean for the congregants? First of all, dear friends, the congregants should consider remuneration. And secondly, respect. So if someone is a servant of Christ, there is room and allowance and there should be a priority for remuneration. For example, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 to 18, in the context where Paul is writing to Timothy in honor of elders, he says, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when he treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. 1 Corinthians 9, 14, in the same way the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Uh, in a day and age of volunteerism, uh, where, you know, people, they sort of look down upon the pastoral office, the eldership office, which is one office. And they expect one who is in ministry to be a volunteer, yet they themselves are working and earning in another field. This, what we see in scripture, is not really popular. Especially in a, in a country like Zimbabwe, where we complain about economy, we say the economy is tough, everything is tough, so we can't afford to pay our pastors. And that's the reason why the church is crippled today, dear friends. That's the reason why we are handicapped, because we are not taking care of the servants of God. We're not coming together as a church and saying, let's put our heads together, let's put our pockets together, and let's pay this man or these men who are laboring in the mission field so that the gospel would spread. If we are taking the gospel seriously, we ought to take this seriously as well. Secondly, respect. Hebrews 13 verse 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls. As those who will have to give an account, let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So, there is a way in which we ought to observe ministers of the gospel as servants of Christ. Because they are servants of Christ, it does not mean that we should not respect them. We must. Because they are watching over our souls. And we'll see that this, this uh, point of respect ties into the second characteristics of the servants of Christ. Sorry, of being servants of Christ. Paul says this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and the steward and stewards of the mysteries of God. So within that being servants, we are to be stewards and not generals. We are to be stewards and not generals. What is Paul talking about? Paul is saying, not only are true preachers of the word of God servants, but they are stewards. They are, a true preacher of God's word must be a steward in handling the word of God and rightly dividing the word of truth. He must be a caretaker of the church and its resources. The minister must have a sword in one hand and a trowel in another. He must build. He must be part of the building process of the body of Christ. Although we know that Christ is the one that builds his church and is the head of the church. But he uses ministers to build the church. And also he must have a sword to uh, to ward off any wolves and those people who seek to cause divisions. Unnecessary divisions. By majoring on minors. 
And the word steward in the Greek means one who is, a, who is an overseer of an estate, but has a master. So the servants of Christ are overseers of the church, but they represent God and they report to God. They must exercise oversight. This is what Paul is saying when he says we are servants and stewards. Peter confirms this. 1 Peter 5 verse 1 to 5. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. As well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Exercising oversight. Not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain. So ministers are not supposed to serve for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples of the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. After having examined the characteristics I want us to see the second point from verse 3 to 5, their critical examination. Let me read the text. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself. But I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, excuse me, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. So Paul moves on. In a, it's almost like in a fashion of sudden shift. It, 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 you, you, even as you study the, the word, you are somehow perplexed to say, what is Paul talking about? Why this sudden shift? But, uh, Paul, but what Paul is focusing on is that ministers, true preachers of the gospel, are servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God, the stewards of, of, of handling the word, but they are under critical examination, critical judgment. There is a lot of scrutiny attached to the minister. He must be well observed by the congregants. He must be well observed by outsiders. They must see whether this man is truly a preacher of the gospel in conduct and even what they preach especially what they preach Paul puts it this way from verse 3 but with me it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you by any human court in fact I do not judge myself what, what Paul is actually talking about here is that even as we are ministers of the mysteries of God and stewards of God's grace, we must focus on what God has called us to do and not over scrutinize ourselves. Paul was saying, even if you judge me, I do not judge myself. I stand on behalf of God. Who is the one who is to judge me? Not myself. The, the minister should not judge himself based on his uh, apparent track record that the congregation have formulated for him. He should trudge on, march on, whether there are discouragements in the congregation, whether he's facing opposition, he must stay upon the Lord and stay put up until the Lord calls him elsewhere. He goes on, for I am not aware of anything against myself. So Paul is in poor fashion at the same time defending his ministry. He's saying, let my ministry speak for, for myself. 
I am not aware of anything against myself. My integrity speaks for me. So for the true preacher of the gospel, his integrity should speak for him. But I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. This is an exhortation for all of us. Let us not be too quick to judge ministry work of the servants of God before time. Let us be patient with one another, long-suffering, praying for one another, plodding with endurance until the Lord's time. There's so many times that you hear of stories of churches completely vaporizing or ex uh, ceasing to exist simply because the congregants were not patient with their minister. They judged before the time of the Lord. This is what Paul is talking about. There are some things that are not worthy to be given much attention now. There are some faults that we can overlook if they're not extremely serious or of a destructive nature. This is how he finishes the section that I, that I am examining. He says, from verse 4 to 5, For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Verse 5, Therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes. Who will bring to light, everything will be brought to light, dear friends. The things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. God is the one that searches the hearts of people and determines the motives. So we must trust God. That each one will receive his commendation from the Lord. And this corresponds to what Peter says in 1 Peter 5. This is both a, a comfort and also a scary thought in reality. Because those who are false teachers, those who propagate falsehoods and teach heresy and lead the masses astray will be judged by God. And they may say, well, you know, God will judge me and seem like they are living a very good life, a very comfortable life, and they are progressing in their evil and sin. But the Bible gives us comfort that God will reveal everything in his time. God will judge. Let me close in 2 Peter 2 verse 1 to 5. I introduced this sermon by touching on false teachers and the likes of Makandiwa. And now I close it with an indictment to them, but a comfort to true preachers of the Word of God. Second Peter 2, 1 to 5, but false prophets also arose among the people. Just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed, and in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. Dear friends, let us meditate upon the true preachers of God's word who are servants and stewards and support the work and wait for the Lord who is to judge the living and the dead. 
And this is what Paul says to Peter in 2 Timothy 4. Preach the word in season and out of season. Because Christ will return. Amen. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Lord God, that your word is sharper than a double edged sword and cutting straight to the heart. Thank you that your Holy Spirit is amongst us and he continues to convict us of sin. And we thank you that, oh God, the true preachers of the word are still being raised and are still there. They exist. We pray that they may continue preaching the true word in season and out of season, in discouragement. And we pray that the congregants would view them the way the Bible says, that they are servants of Christ and stewards of God's uh, grace. We pray, O oh Lord, that you may continue to be with us for the rest of the day. Keep us meditating on this word. And um, may we enjoy a blessed fellowship. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.